Hi and welcome to this session of Mind of the Manager with Ford Asset Management. I'm Linda Eads and I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Portfolio Managers Nick Balkan and Rashad Tayab. Now most of you know that Nick Balkan is one of the Portfolio Managers on our Ford Equity Fund as well as being one of the Portfolio Managers on the multi-asset funds that we're going to be talking today, about today. Now Rashad is a recent addition to our team, he joined the team last month in fact and he's come on board not only as a macro strategist, which is the role that he's going to be fulfilling today, talking about macroeconomics, but he's also going to be co-managing three new funds that we're going to be launching on the 1st of October. And these are three fixed income funds, the Ford Income Fund, the Ford Flex Income Fund, and the Ford Balance Fund. And he's going to be co-managing those along with Fazana Bayat who also joined us in August. So we're going to be telling you a lot more about those funds, so watch that space. But today's session is about our multi-asset funds. How are we looking at the global environment, the macroeconomic landscape, and how that factors into our positioning. So Rashad's going to actually give us a little bit about what we're thinking on the macroeconomic front. And then Nick's going to take over to actually discuss what we're invested in and why. But before we get to that, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a bit of context with regards to how the funds have been performing in this most recent market landscape. At the end, we're going to do a bit of a Q&A session. So thank you very much to those of you who have submitted questions in advance. It's very much going to shape our discussion. But please also feel free to add some questions in the Q&A box on your screen. And if we don't get to those today, we will definitely get back to you with, the question, with an answer on those after this session. Please excuse us if we have any technical disruptions. We are actually having load shedding in Cape Town as we speak, uh, but we'll do our best to keep the show on the road. So along with my new team members that have joined and along with the new fixed income funds that we're going to be launching on the 1st of October, we have a few other things to celebrate this month. Um, on the 1st of September, two of our funds, the Ford Equity Fund, as well as the Ford Balance Fund, actually turned 20 years old. Now, um, the thing to note is not that uh, the Ford Equity Fund has come third in its category over that time. It's actually the fact that only 14 funds have survived for that length of time. Now, in that category, there are actually 139 funds today. And the Ford Balance Fund has come fourth over that time period. And in that category, there are only 17 funds that have actually stood the test of time, that actually started out with a fund at that start date 20 years ago. And in that category, there are actually more than 200 funds. So of course, one can also think about the fact that there have been many funds which have disappeared from the category over time as well. And I think this speaks to the longevity of our approach and why it works over full multiple cycles. For us, the true measure of a manager is actually to produce meaningful inflation-beating returns over time. And we're very pleased to say that the Ford Balance Fund has actually delivered a return of 12.6% per year after fees for its investors. And that's actually 7% above inflation. And I think, of course, having inflation-beating returns is something that is particularly top of mind when we consider the landscape both locally and globally today. Now, if you consider those managers that have stood the test of time, they've not been typically the managers that have shot the lights out at the top of the market. They've actually been managers that have done very well to protect capital in market declines and then to participate very meaningfully in the recovery that follows. So it's that combination of things, protection of capital and growing capital when the opportunities present themselves that have allowed managers to actually manage money for a long period of time. And Ford has been around for more than four decades. And we've been focused on the first part of that equation over the year to date. We've been focused on the protection of capital. Now, as managers that have a forward thinking element to our approach, We've been defensively positioned for quite some time. So we've been anticipating what we're seeing coming out for quite a while. And that did mean that our funds were actually lagging from a performance perspective for quite some time, particularly last year. And of course, there's been quite a shift in terms of what the market has done. And a lot of the risks that we've been concerned about for quite some time have actually started to now manifest themselves in market returns. 
So we actually, if we look at this first slide, it's a really stark reminder of how much the investment opportunity set has changed during the course of 2022. Now, firstly, you can see in the orange bars how the various asset classes have performed over the year to date, and in dark gray, how our funds, particularly our multi-asset funds, which we're talking about today, have fared given that opportunity set to invest in. Now, on the left-hand side, we've got dollar-based returns because those returns pertain to the global markets and our global multi-asset fund, the Ford International Fund. And on the right-hand side of the chart, you see our local asset classes and our local funds and how they've done. And I think it's really quite stark to once again remind ourselves of how tricky this market environment has been for anybody, both us and those managing investments on behalf of their clients as financial advisors, or even just as investors participating in these markets. It's been a really challenging year. Looking at the various asset classes, we can see that world equities are down more than 17%. Global bonds, which are supposed to oftentimes protect in this kind of market environment, have actually also been down as much, more than 17% in dollar terms from the start of this year to the end of August. Global property is down almost 19%, and emerging market equities are down over 19%. Now, on the, compare that to the Ford International Fund, which is down 2.6%, and I think we're very pleased that the part of our process that seeks to protect capital, so that you have as much of that capital intact to participate meaningfully in the recovery that follows, has done its job. And if you look at the right-hand side of this chart, you can see the same situation for the multi-asset class funds that we manage on the local side. This next slide actually shows the returns of the funds in comparison to their peer universe. So previously, we were looking at how the funds performed relative to the asset classes in which they can invest. But here we're looking at how they fare relative to peers in the category. Now, this is a very busy chart, so I really want to explain what we're looking at before I actually talk to those numbers. This is called a box and whiskers chart. And what's meaningful about this chart is that it not only gives you a sense of how the funds have performed relative to their peers, but it also gives you a good idea of the dispersion of returns, the range of returns, the worst case scenario especially given an environment such as the one that we've seen where asset classes have performed so poorly. So if you look at the vertical line from top to bottom for each of those funds, the line represents the range of returns from the highest to the lowest return of all the funds in the category. The dark blue box is the second quartile of returns with the light blue box representing the third quartile. So if you combine those two boxes together, half of all the fund returns in these categories sit within those two boxes. The area above the boxes represents the top quartile, or the top 25% of fund returns, and the area below those boxes represents the bottom quartile, or the worst 25% of returns. And the first thing, of course, that we're pleased to see is that over this market environment, which has been very different to what we faced before, this is the environment that we've positioned for, that we've anticipated, that you need to be positioned for ahead of. In this market environment, you can see that every single one of the funds has performed in the top quartile. But importantly, if you could look at the range of returns, you can see the worst case scenario, given the cracks that are starting to show in the system. <clears throat> so let's take the Ford Flexible Fund, which is the fund on the far right. You can see the fund is in the top quartile as the dot is above the boxes. So we know that it outperformed more than 75% of the funds in this category. Now you might be quite surprised to hear that we've actually done that with quite high allocations to equities throughout this market environment. So we're certainly not sitting in cash. And of course, if you were sitting in cash, it would be quite difficult to time your re-entry back into equity markets to participate in that upturn. Importantly, you can also see that the worst return over this time frame was actually minus 31%. And I think this gives a good sense of how important it is to manage risk and hold your ground in these kind of market environments. If you lose 20 to 30% of your investors' capital 
in this kind of market decline, you've got a lot of catching up to do before you can start actually outperforming inflation, which should be your ultimate objective. So up until this year, the, the, this year up until 2022, the risks in the market, market just simply hadn't started to bear. But we're in that market environment now, and investors can rest assured that we're very well prepared for what we're seeing. <clears throat> the good news is that as sure as day follows night, there will be a recovery in markets at some point in the future. Now, we don't think that we're smart enough to call the bottom of the market, but that's why we already have a reasonably high allocation to equities already, and Nick's going to unpack exactly where we're invested and what we're invested in there. We're in equities not only because they provide the best protection against inflation, but also because you can't wait until after the market recovers to actually invest in equities. You actually need to be positioned ahead of that market turning. And this also speaks to how important it is for investors to actually remain invested throughout the cycle. Now I'm going to hand over to Rashad, who's going to give you a sense about our thinking with regards to unpacking the macroeconomic landscape as a starting point to deciding where we invest your capital at this point in time. So with that, over to you, Rashad. So Ford is a, a valuation-driven asset manager, so we look at valuations from a bottom-up perspective in terms of security selection, but also a top-down perspective in terms of understanding the macro environment. So what I'm going to do today is unpack the macro, macro valuation framework that Ford uses, and then Nick will explain how we incorporate these signals and these ideas in order to add investments to the portfolio and construct them. Now, Macro is notoriously difficult uh, in the market. In fact, there's a lot of managers out there who say they totally ignore the macro. Uh, however, we don't necessarily believe in follow, following that blinkered approach because it's the economic, the social, and the political environment plays a large part in determining the outcomes for your investments and the securities that you select in your portfolio. Now, I think that... Um, uh, the reason that Ford has done well in terms of incorporating macro into its framework is because we followed a consistent approach over time. So it's not just looking at the short-term data points. If you look at Bloomberg, we get a thousand data points released almost every day. There's headlines moving from, from one thing to the next. But we follow a consistent approach and focus on the long-term cycles. And it's that consistent approach, that forward-looking approach, is why we've been able to incorporate macro so successfully over a period of time. And today, I'm going to run through that valuation framework and how we approach macro. So the, the forward... Uh, framework starts with an approach called MICE, which is, our, uh, which is how we gauge the temperature for markets. MICE stands for money in the markets, interest rates, confidence, and earnings. And I'm going to go through each of these and explain to you what we're seeing at the moment and how we, how we see things going forward. Starting with money in the markets, that is the liquidity that's available to buy into the market at any point in time. And in this type of environment, that liquidity is driven primarily by what central banks are doing in terms of their balance sheets. Interest rates are a key driver of global markets. The interest rate determines the cost of borrowing, and if the cost of borrowing is low, that means there's more money for in, for in order to spend and in order to invest. Confid while interest rates determine the cost of borrowing, it's confidence which de determines the demand and therefore the, the, the amount that investors are willing to, 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 to put into the economy. So we need to understand where sentiment is and what investors are feeling in terms of the market. And then finally, earnings. Earnings are your ultimate driver of long-term equity returns. And we need to understand where earnings are in terms of the cycle and what are the pressures on earnings going forward. And MICE works because we're following this consistent framework. We're not fixating on short-term data. And for each of these, we're looking at where things are, but also where they're potentially headed. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to start off with money for the markets. And what I've got here is a measure of US dollar liquidity, which is primarily driven by what the Fed is doing in terms of its bond holdings. It's made up of the, of the Fed bond holdings, the bank repos, and treasury deposits of, at the Fed. You can see that in 2020, during the COVID crisis, liquidity was increased massively by over $5 trillion, and that provided a massive tailwind to the markets. However, starting in 2021, liquidity began to decrease, and it's no surprise that you have seen a lot of headwinds over the course of the year. This chart, the next, next chart, shows what the Fed is doing in terms of its balance sheet, which is the biggest driver of that dollar liquidity. The, the top one shows the US, uh, the Fed's treasury holdings, and you can see how that's increased and has begun and has flattened out and has begun to come down. The second one shows the, tre the Fed's holding of mortgage-backed securities. Now, we've also got here what the projections are, are for the Fed balance sheet if they follow their stated plans. Now, the Fed has said that they're going to reduce their holdings of treasury bonds by $60 billion a month and their holdings of mortgage-backed securities by $35, $35 billion a month. So that's $95 billion in total. On an annualized basis, they're looking to reduce liquidity by over a trillion dollars. So if you, if you look at what they're doing, a lot of liquidity will continue to be extracted from the market going forward. But we need to pay attention to what they do, not necessarily what they say, because you can, also, you can already see some cracks appearing in their plans. For example, they plan to reduce mortgage-backed securities by $35 billion a month, but to date, they haven't actually reduced it at all. And the reason for that is that with mortgage rates having gone up from 3% to 6%, there's no redemptions. Um, you, mortgage owners who've locked in a very low rate are not repaying their mortgages, and the Fed doesn't necessarily want to go into the market and sell more mortgage-backed securities and push that rate even higher while the housing market is under pressure. So there are already cracks appearing in their plans, and we need to be very aware of what they're actually doing, not what they're saying. But overall, if they, we can see continued pressure in terms of money for the markets as the Fed looks to withdraw liquidity, but it can change at any point in time. On the interest rate side, we know that global interest rates have gone up significantly over the course of the year. The graph shows the Fed funds rate uh, in, in the dark blue line, and then the red line shows, shows the forward Fed, Fed funds rate, which is already above the 4% level. So the Fed was very much behind the curve. They only started hiking rates in March when, in, when inflation had already hit 8%. They, at that point, they only increased rates about a quarter percentage point and, and talked a lot about how inflation was only going to be transitory. transitory. Once it became obvious that inflation was sticky, they had to accelerate that hiking pro program quite rapidly. And now that forward rates are over 4%, we're very close to the post-crisis peak, sorry, the pre-crisis peak where, inflation, where interest rates got to 5% albeit we do have a much higher, of higher level of inflation this time around. So the Fed is behind the curve in, on inflation, and it will be interesting to see how they progress in terms of their plan going forward. Now, that's on the front end of the curve, but what we like to focus on is the US real interest rate as taken from the inflation-linked bond market. The real long-term rate is, in my view, the most important rate in the global financial system. This is the real rate of dollar borrowings, and it determines the real cost of borrowings, the cost of borrowings after inflation. You can see that in the, in, over the course of the year, the US real interest rate has gone from minus 1% all the way to plus 1%. That is a 200 basis point increase in a very short space of time. And if you look at at the last 10 years, when you have had sharp increases in the real interest rate, it has caused a problem in terms of the markets and asset prices. We saw that in 2013, where the, the Fed was increasing rates and it precipitated the taper, what we know as the taper tantrum. Markets fell and it was a massive problem for emerging markets, including South Africa. Then in 2017, the Fed started its hiking cycle. It was very measured and slow, just 25 basis points increments. And then by the late 2018, the real 10-year rate got above 1%, and you saw a big sell-off in, in, in markets, and they had to reverse course quite quickly. So we're very cautious 
as we hit that 1% level, that there's not much room for them to increase, and if they do decide to push it further and move aggressively, it could, could precipitate a risk off event in markets. The C in my stands for confidence, and what we like to do here is gauge sentiment in the market, how investors are positioned, how the media is approaching the investment world out there. And what I've got here is the last four economist covers, and you can see that there's no shortage of things for the investors to worry about at the moment. On the left-hand side, uh, it's highlighting the problems within the UK. While they've got inflation at high levels, they've got energy prices uh, out of control, the, the, the conservatives were having a, a massive political power battle, and now you've got the, you know, the queen has passed away on top of, to, on top of that. Uh, the, the second two weeks ago, we had the US on the front page where the, it's highlighting the polarization in, in between the Democrats and the Republicans. It's as bad as it's been in, 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 in several hundred years. Three weeks ago was Russia. Europe, there's, a, there's a war on Europe's doorstep, and sanctions are really biting and affecting both parties quite badly. And then a month ago, we had a focus on Asia, where the issues with China and the tensions with Taiwan are going to be a continued theme of the market going forward. So there's no shortage of things to investors, for investors to be worried, worried about, and that is reflected in how a lot of investors are positioned in the market. So if we look at sentiment, and it leads on to investor positioning, you'd find that investors are more underweight equities than they were in the financial crisis of 2008. So, they, so they, it already reflects a low confidence uh, in terms of investor concerns. If we look at the Eurozone, it feels like this is a constant con source of concern for the market. Uh, they have a massive debt problem, and you need constant action by the European Central Bank as well as the Europe in Parliament to keep it together. Now, Italy has an election coming up, and what I've shown here is the Italian bond yield minus the German bond yield. And as concerns rise, you see that that spread has increased from 1% to over 2.5%. So risk premiums are on the rise in the Eurozone, but then you can see what happens uh, when you do get Eurozone crisis, and we have seen uh, a, a few of those since, since 2010. And then just credit spreads are also a way to gauge investor concerns. And what I've got here is high yield corporate spreads, which are the spreads of the, lo the lowest quality companies within a sector, which will be most impacted by a potential slowdown. And here you're seeing the spreads move from around 200 basis points to over 500 basis points. So credit spreads have widened as investors are fearing a slowdown. So overall, confidence is quite low, but investors are not panicking yet. And then the E in my stands for earnings. And as I mentioned, it's the real earnings which are the ultimate driver of, of, of long-term returns. And what I've got here is the MSCI world real earnings relative to its trend. And you can see there has been a massive recovery in earnings. It's rebounded as the government has handed out free money during the COVID crisis. And the result is that earnings are now well above trend. And now that governments are making some attempt to pull back on their spending, there is definitely a downside risk to earnings, a headwind going forward, especially given the current elevated levels. So that is the MICE framework that we use, and it's our guide to the temperature of the market and understanding what the signals are that the different macro, understanding what the macro signals are telling us in terms of our positioning. Money in the markets, it's already reduced, but with the, Fed's, with the Fed's plans to reduce liquidity by a trillion dollars over the next year, there still remains potential headwinds to the market. I showed interest rates, they've already gone up a lot, but the Fed is talking quite aggressively, and this is the big question mark in the, mar in, in, in the market at the moment. How aggressive is the Fed going to be in terms of hiking rates in order co to control inflation? Confidence is at a low level, but maybe not at rock bottom. And then finally, earnings are above this, are, are at a high level relative to the cycle, with headwinds as investors look to reduce. So overall, what MICE is telling us that we've been correct in assuming a cautious stance, and we should follow, continue to follow a cautious approach going forward. And Nick will explain how we incorporate this while still looking for opportunities in order to make money for investors. Before I hand over to him, I'm just going to run through what we're seeing from the South African side of the macro framework, and I'll start off with inflation.
this is a this is a chart of historical inflation as well as a projection going on until the end of 2023 based on a survey of economists that we believe are highly credible. And you can see that inflation moved above the target band earlier this year. So we were behind the curve in inflation. We, we moved above uh, later than, uh, a lot, uh, than a lot of countries around the world. And we're likely to remain elevated above the target until the second quarter of next year before moving back within the target. And, it, and in, economists are seeing us back to the four and a half percent level. Our view is that given the global inflation dynamic as well as the government spending in South Africa, we are likely to be towards the five to six percent level rather than to the midpoint of the band and we positioning as such. But on the back of the inflation rising, uh, the Saab has been forced to hike rates. So what I've got here is the Saab repo rate in the dark blue line and the red line is the forward rate which is what, ma what market expectations are for rates six months forward. You can see we've hiked rates from three and a half percent by up to five and a half percent. So 200 basis points of interest rates. But we've just moved from what were extremely low unsustainable levels given our inflation dynamic as well as our status as a sub-investment grade emerging market. Now, rates are going to move higher, maybe not to quite up to that 8% level, but 7 to 7.5% 7 is definitely on the cards, and those rate hikes are going to be a headwind to the domestic economy and companies uh, over the course of the next year. And following on to that, our, our, this is um, the bonds compared to our fair value. The dark blue line uh, shows our forward fair value bond yield, while the red line shows what the actual 10-year bond in the market is at the moment. And you can see that last year, bond deals were below fair value, and towards the end of last year, they moved above fair value, and, and they have been cheap over the course of the year. Currently, bonds are slightly cheap versus fair value, but not as cheap as they, were, as they got two months ago. So we do see value in the bond market, but we are aware that in a stress scenario, bond deals can move higher and we need to plan accordingly. And then finally on the RAND, uh, this shows a, a chart of the RAND versus the fair value. The light green line is the RAND dollar exchange rate. The darker line is the fair value line over the last 30 years. And you can see that during stress periods, the, the RAND does sell off significant, to significant levels above fair value. So at the moment, we do think the RAND is is, is cheap, but it's not in one of those extreme, per, extreme uh, periods. So while we see a lot of value in the global context, we'll continue to have a material offshore exposure, and we're not looking to reduce offshore exposure unless we see the RAND at extreme values relative to fair value. So that is the framework from the global as well as lo local context. And I'll talk about, and I'll hand over to Nick, who's going to talk about how we incorporate these signals and ideas in order to construct, I, construct portfolios and add investments to the portfolios. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say you might have seen the lights go out and on, so we apologize for that. That's just the load shedding coming and going. Um, yeah, I'd like to welcome Rashad. I think. Um, I've worked with him for a few months now, and absolutely we've been super impressed with him. It's a, we believe he's an, a, a perfect cultural fit and an intellectual fit. One of the key points of hiring anyone is to make sure that you hire people that are smarter than you. And I think with Rashad and Fazan, I think we've done that in both cases. And we look forward to them adding significant value for investors over the long term. So as Rashad noted, the Fed is absolutely behind the curve. They were behind the curve before when they didn't raise rates, when there were more jobs than job seekers, and we expect them to stay behind the curve. That means that inflation is going to stay higher for longer. In that world, we think that the Goldilocks view of the world markets is off the table. What are Goldilocks? We've spoken about it a few times, just to clarify. That's when growth was very strong and inflation stayed very low, which allowed the Fed to, to not react. As they raise rates, as Rashad shows, the risks are definitely to the downside. But we built for these environments. This is where benchmark huggers will come unstuck. We've got significant tools in our toolbox to work out how to manage the risks. Both from a top-down perspective and a bottom-up perspective, we are um, 
at, under control in how we look at it. And we look at it via asset allocation and we look at it via security selection also. So if inflation is to be prolonged, which asset class is the asset class that we need to focus on? So I think Linda has spoken about it and Rashad has spoken about it, but generally we are an equity centric house in that if you look at any period over the long term, equities tend to outperform bonds. What is this chart? This chart, the blue line shows you equities versus bond performance on a 10 year rolling basis. You see that the blue line is sitting way above zero for most of that period. This is all the way from 1920 to today, or, or I would say 10 years ago, given that, that there's a, a 10 year rolling number. The two periods that the, the blue line goes below zero are during the Great Depression era of the 1920s, 1930s, and also when the internet bubble popped in 2000. Interestingly enough, the red line is the inflation rate. And as you can see from that line, there was a period in the 1970s. It's becoming a lot more topical and people are talking about the 1970s a lot when the Fed didn't raise rates and inflation became a bigger problem. You can see that rising red line. But you can also see that in that world, which was tough for equities and bonds, equities continue to do very well. The key here is to make sure that you own equities with pricing power. In that world, so how do we deal with, obviously there's the risk of inflation that I spoke about, but how do we deal with, is it one of those periods of 1920? Is it a period you know, of the internet bubble? Let's, let's look at that in, in a little bit more detail. So after the sell-off, so the line, the, the squiggly line is actually the S&P um, through time. And as you can see, we've seen the correction in the year uh, to date. And that line has brought the PE back to a relatively normal long-term PE of 17 times. Interestingly, uh, sorry, just to clarify, the red line is the upper bound of the near-term PE. And the, obviously that uh, orangey yellow uh, line is the lower bound. And then the blue would be in the middle. So the P is kind of in the middle of, of the long-term range, uh, but it's slightly higher than the ultimate long-term range over a very long period of around 16 times. The key for us is not therefore the rating. We aren't in that world where the internet bubble um, is a signal that the rating is crazy. What Richard showed you is we're more scared of earnings. Earnings are cyclically high. And there are two parts to PE. There's the price, but there's also the earnings. What makes us worried is actually that the earnings might come off as interest rates go up and people um, obviously have less in their pockets to spend. So if we were being an equity centric house, we generally do have lots of equities. But if you forced us to own the market, we would generally have a lower than normal weight in equities. This brings me to equity selection. The reason we have 70% in equities, as we've referred to a few times, or 69%, is that it's a bifurcated market. There's lots of expensive stocks, but which are, you know, it could be an internet stock that's a valuation issue, or it could be an unsustainable earnings, which is a cyclical company that will have its earnings fall. But there's also lots of opportunities. Globally, we're very small, and we don't need to be the market. There are lots of companies that we can hold that don't have the exuberance built in. So what we've done, and I think we might have shown a similar table before, is just the top internet companies that people would own globally versus Ford's global holdings um, in the technology sector. It means we can still participate in the technology sector, but at half the multiple um, of the global stocks. As you can see, it's a 39 times um, EV to free cash flow for the global internet companies, and we are significantly lower that, than that in our portfolios. Interestingly enough, the revenue is actually faster growth in the basket that we have. And the one other comment is that there's a lot of expense management in the Chinese technology companies that will continue to benefit. There are many other global ideas. It could be companies that are dealing from the economic cycle, like biotech companies. We have a really great analyst that covers biotech for us out of Singapore or the copper market that just has absolute long-term growth and real problems with supply. For us, the perfect example of security selection in this whole example that I've spoken about is that from a gross point of view, meaning how many securities do we own in the Ford International, it would be 72% of the portfolio. You've heard us refer to the 53% net equity exposure. That means that there's a short position of 19% in the equity future which reduced that. 
that shows you that we're finding lots of good discrete opportunities, but the market is as a whole quite expensive. Turning to South Africa, we still believe that there's a constrained environment in South Africa. Valuations, however, have adjusted. And we have the ability to participate in many companies at very good prices, even though the um, economy isn't picking up. If I talk about some of the, 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 the sectors that I've put on the slide, we participated in capital raises of both Omnia and Fashini during the COVID period. We still hold those companies today as we believe they're still very good opportunities. From a banking point of view, we also think that's a huge opportunity. Importantly, they geared to the interest rate cycle. The higher interest rates go, the better banks do. Importantly, they got lots of provisions that should things not turn out right, that they can use in that case. We also know that they've overcapitalized, having kept a lot of capital during COVID. So not only are they participating in the rising rate cycle, but they're also very well capitalized should things not work out. So there are lots of opportunities. The caveat is that the 2032 bond, which is effectively the risk-free rate, is at 10.6% now. That raises the required return out of any South African company. Should things really get worse, it becomes a much tougher benchmark for our companies to, to beat. Importantly, as I said, one of the ways we can do it is to find companies that are dealing from the economic cycle, like the healthcare sector. It's pretty timeless to talk about Aspen. We own as I showed from that previous chart, hospitals and pharmaceutical companies. You know, we have spoken about Aspen before, and many people do talk about ESG, but I think Aspen is one of those companies that you can do good and make money at the same time. It's timeless to talk about it because they signed a 10-year deal with the Serum Institute from India, the biggest vaccine maker in the world. These aren't for COVID vaccines. These are for vaccines for Africa, sponsored by people like the Bill Gates Foundation, or the Gates Foundation. It's not for, as I said, COVID vaccines, but more annual vaccinations of kids. You know how we sent our kids for the chickenpox vaccine or all those sorts of things. Um, and it's a 10-year deal, importantly. So this chart here just shows the red are the historical earnings and the blue is the forecast earnings um, without any numbers on the side. What it does show you is there is more than 1 billion doses of spare capacity in Aspen. If they make five rand per dose, which is a possibility, that's more than five billion additional rands in profits that will come from filling their capacity. As the global companies, as the global investors have pulled money from South Africa, and we could show charts on foreign equity outflows or bond outflows, opportunities are opening for the people that are staying in South Africa. This is just one discrete opportunity. Um, we had a very small holding in PSG, and when they announced the unbundling, it was quite curious to us, even till the day before, which was the 6th of September of the unbundling, that PSG was trading at a significant discount to its sum of the parts. The next day after the unbundling, we made 9% just from holding the pieces that were given out of PSG, notwithstanding the fact that we got a cash component inside there, which made it even less risky. Importantly, we didn't buy it for the 9%. We actually do like the companies that are underlying, the key two being PSG Consult and Cura. Importantly, we do think that there's a lot more upside into the future, and we didn't do it just for that unlock. There are, sorry, I just flicked back. There are other uh, opportunities also in this, in this tactical area, which I just don't think people are looking at. And uh, there's one stock where there's a very similar peer trading on the stock market at a 12% discount. And it's there in plain sight for anyone to see. If anyone really wants to know the answer, they can call me directly and I'll tell them. But it's not only what you do buy in investments, it's sometimes what you choose to hold a lot less of or not own at all. In this case, that's platinum group metals. In the, in the left-hand side of the chart, that's Amplat's revenue in blue versus its cost per ounce in red. The times to avoid these companies are when they're making super profits. The time to buy it is before the super profits, not when they're happening. As you can see, generally after those super profits, things normalize and the pain comes later. Not only that, there is a real thematic headwind for platinum companies as EVs grow as a share of, of vehicles over time. Using just 2019 numbers, you can show that Impala's headline earnings per share would be down 
90%, which is a huge number and just shows how cyclical some of these companies' earnings are. Talking about bonds, given the time, I think we have heard from the expert and we have talk, talked a lot about the R186, which is around a four-year bond, so we won't really harp on that. What I will say is it's protected very well through all the volatility, through the rising um, uh, yield curve, but what has happened is the 2032 bond does to a certain extent, if we manage our position holding, offer good value. Once again, as I said, it's key to hold a position size that you're comfortable with because the balance sheet in South Africa is getting worse and it is 10 years out. Having said that, the yield has compensated to a certain extent at 10.6%. So what I did was I did a sensitivity around that, showing if the yield curve suddenly moves from 10.6% to 12.6%. Obviously, a rising yield for a bond is bad if you buy a fixed coupon. But if you hold it for three years, that's the key point. You're still going to make your 12%, 12, uh, your 10.6% coupon. You will lose some value because of the valuation of the bond, but you will still make 8% on that bond altogether from a three-year holding period. The key there is even with that margin of safety of 2%, we still perform pretty much in line than if you just went and bought a three-year bond, which does show you that margin of safety. Having said that, we do need to have caution here, given the balance sheet in South Africa. The last part of the, the armory um, is gold. We've spoken a few times about it, and we've spoken about gold in dollars. Given the time, I probably won't spend too much time on it. Suffice to say, it's not only an inflation hedge, but it's absolutely the insurance policy that will pay out when you need it most. This is golden rands, showing that it's a lot less of a cost to investors from a rand perspective. Turning to the multi-asset positioning, I don't, I, I, for simplicity, I put, I, I put all of them, but for simplicity, I, I, I will talk about one particular multi-asset fund, which is the balance fund. I think importantly, as we've said, we have 69% in equities. I wouldn't fixate on that number. I would rather ask which equities you own. I think that's sometimes lost in translation and investing. Um, the balance fund generally has around that 69%. We do have local bonds of around 12%. Um, and in the global bonds, they are very short duration bonds. Rashad showed you how appealing some of the two-year money is in dollars uh, from a government point of view. Um, but not on the long end. On the property side of things, we have a very low weight. And we think that they're very geared entities. And obviously, with rising rates, act as a big headwind to the property sector, notwithstanding the cash flow disclosure in some of the property companies. So all in all, I think there's still a lot of opportunities to grow ahead of inflation while still protecting against the downside. You just can't look only at the market to do that. So yeah, I think that concludes my part of the presentation. I think we are going to go to q and yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Nick. So first of all, I think everybody's getting to know Rashad a little bit better, um, and certainly we've enjoyed getting to know him here at Ford. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to put to you, Rashad, is how your macro analysis, if at all, has changed since you joined Ford? So as Nick mentioned, I joined a month ago, but I've actually been working with the team for the last few months so that we're able to exchange ideas and, and we're able to hit the ground running quite quickly. And I've talked about uh, the MICE framework, which is money for the markets, interest rates, confidence and earnings. And those are all things I've looked at for a long period of time. So for over two decades, you do analyze interest rates, central banks, etc. But what I've been very happy to do is work with the team, get their ideas, and incorporate that MICE framework into my thinking because I think it's a very way, it's a very good way to look at macro on a very consistent forward-looking approach. So my, my thinking hasn't so much changed as evolved, and I think for the better. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so let's go to some of the questions that have been put to us. And thanks again to those who have submitted questions. I believe there were some issues uh, getting onto the call for some of our participants. So apologies for that. Um, we're all having to obviously deal with the curveballs that load shedding throws us now and then. And thank you very much for your patience. We will be sending out a recording. So hopefully you can still catch the beginning of the presentation, even if you were only able to join late. Apologies for that again. So we had two questions uh, which were quite similar from Manus and Andre. They met, both made very valid points. 
Uh, they reference the fact that it seems curious that central banks, such as the Fed in particular, I think is what they're mostly referring to here, have allowed inflation to creep into the system through the huge amounts of stimulus and support packages that they've provided. So in many ways, they've actually created the problem. Why now to be hiking so aggressively knowing the harm that that would cause? And I think Andre put it very nicely. He said, surely you can't beat the dog for chewing on the bone first place. Rashad, perhaps your comment on this with specific reference, I think, to the Fed. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, both of us have referenced the fact that the Fed was behind the curve. They were hiking rates. They, they, they basically only hiked rates when inflation was already at 8%. Last year, the U.S. house prices were up 15% while they were buying, you know, almost $100 billion of mortgage-backed securities a month. So while the housing bubble was getting going, they were basically adding fuel to the fire. So, I, I mean, I don't disagree with that. A lot of people would argue that uh, one of the, you know, the Fed is the biggest problem in the market. And, you know, I don't disagree with that. Um, I think that they've gone from being uh, overly stimulative to now, if you look at that, that 10 year real rate, they've, it's already gone up a lot. And they are talking more aggressively. And if they do that, they risk causing a significant downturn in the economy and the market. So moving to how the market reacts to all of that, I mean, it looked for a brief period of time that we might be off to the races again. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of August, we had a short, sharp correction again. Um, and of course, on Tuesday this week, we actually had um, the largest sell off that we've had in the markets in the US in the last two years. Ian wants to know, are short, sharp correction form? even after 10 years of an extended bull market, which obviously was fueled by some of the things that you've mentioned now, uh, Rishar, responding much quicker than we used to. I guess the question, and I'd like you to answer this, Nick, is you know, how likely is it that we might see extended bear markets that we saw quite far back, actually, rather than a short, sharp correction and then back off to the races again? Uh, it's a cool... Um, Way of explaining markets. I think in the old days, markets were used to go up on an escalator and they used to come down in an elevator. What that effectively means is they go up very slowly and then there's a sudden fall down in markets. More recently, what we're seeing, the Fed just don't want to have a cycle. They don't want that, that effect of, of a short, sharp correction in their power to stop it. But as you said at one of your points, as day turns to night, there will be a cycle. They can only delay the cycle. They can only kick it further. There will always be a cycle. The further you, the longer you resist the cycle, the longer the payback period is, unfortunately. So the Fed hasn't had the ability to, to cut cycles forever. Cycles will exist when I'm dead. And uh, yeah, they can only delay a cycle. They can't change the fact that there are cycles. Yes, and I think many people often make the point that with regards to behave the circumstances might change but human beings have not so our investor psychology obviously also contributes to those boom and bust sort of parts of the market cycle that we can take advantage of of course um, but let's turn to a slightly different edge here um, Graham asks he uh, asked a very specific question which I don't think we're going to answer he wanted to know what do we think the oil price will be by the end of 2022? Um, so unfortunately, Graham, we definitely aren't smart enough to be able to pinpoint exactly what that number would be. Um, but we did see oil prices drop below the psychological level of $90 earlier this month. They're back up again. Um, Next, some um, energy exposure in our funds. It's small, but we do have allocation to energy producers and businesses associated with energy production. And we also do have, interestingly, some exposure to materials companies, which are in the production of rare earth metals and the types of minerals that one needs for the clean energy transition. Yeah. So how do we think about how energy prices will play out given those supply and demand dynamics? Yeah, I think um, there's a short-term answer and there's a long-term answer. I think in the short term, we've spoken about a few times, the fact that the ESG type investors are pushing uh, to not fund any of the oil, oil, oil exploration means that there's definitely going to be a short-term squeeze on the oil price, notwithstanding the fact that Russia has obviously um, taken some of the supply out of the market. It means that the oil price in the short term is going to 
behalf of, uh, and, and from a risk re return point of view, we think that there's more chance a lower oil price in the ultra short term. In the longer term, we're not building an 80 to 90 percent in our forecast. The futures curve is signaling a 60 to 70 percent, 60 to 70 dollar oil price, but that's not too far from our reality either. Importantly, the amount of cash flows that you'll receive in some of these oil companies, especially the global ones, um, are, are so much more that it will compensate. And it's rather the decline in the cash flows, interestingly enough, of those companies that will define how well the investment does or not. Um, when it comes to the new energy side, because you raised it, I think, importantly, we probably have a bigger weight towards that side be it via lithium that's going to provide the batteries into the, the vehicles or the copper, which a lot of people are talking about more recently, which is really in short supply and going to be needed in the electric vehicles also. We have many different ways that we're actually playing that new energy side of things, and that's probably more interesting to us um, than a small portion of allocation to the energy side of things. Yes, yeah, so I suppose it's again about putting together a portfolio of robust investment ideas which have different drivers and making sure that you take advantage of diversification, which as Dave always reminds me is the only free lunch in investing. Uh, Terence actually makes a few points which I think will probably resonate with most South Africans at this point. He says parts of South Africa are becoming economic wastelands. Towns are becoming ghost towns. Our economy is becoming so lopsided. How can we possibly counter unemployment if this continues without some sort of strategy to grow our economy countrywide? Rashad, I think given that you've been looking at the South African situation, perhaps you can comment on that. I mean, everyone is very negative. We're all feeling uh, the, the stress in the system. Uh, what are the problems the growth in the sort of medium to long term for South Africa? Yeah, it's, it's been a very tough period. I think since 2010, we've only grown by about 1% per annum. And while we've only grown by 1% per annum, we've added over $3 trillion of debt to the system. So we've spent a lot of money, but it hasn't actually, it's not showing up anywhere. And I think the one of the core problems is that the government has effectively dominated the economic system of the country, and they've put themselves at the center of the economy. And there was a lot of hope when uh, President Trump him into power given his his background in business that at the end of the day the free market and the and the and the and the and the and the corporate sector needs to be the one driving employment it can't be the you know the government you know hire, hiring people and there was hope that with him coming into power uh, there would be more of a focus on and putting more growth um, supporting policies in place unfortunately we haven't seen any we haven't seen much to date uh, to give him a little bit of an excuse, uh, we were hit by COVID, the COVID crisis very shortly after he came into power. So maybe there, there has been some distractions, uh, but, but it has been a big disappointment. Only recently, after many years of having a power crisis, do we now see some signs where we've got a power plan and they're removing the caps on independent power producers. But I think we need a lot more in this regard if we, need, if we, if we, if we can get our growth rate back up again. That's really the only solution to, to the, the, you know, improving the outcomes for people in this country, getting growth up and driving employment, and we need more of the confidence coming through from the private sector. So I mentioned confidence as one of the factors of mice, and confidence is key because at the end of the day, regardless of what rates are, it's people's belief in the future which drives their decisions on investments. So we need that to come through if we are going to begin to reverse that, that some of the decline we've had. Yes, absolutely. Sorry to interrupt. I think it also comes down to the government is almost forced into it sometimes because of the lack of resources. We see what's happening in the ports. We see what's happening in, uh, as you said, the power producers. What might happen is they just, through lack of money, need the private sector to come through. So that is one of the op options that, that the scenarios that play out is that just via um, the need that the private sector will play a bigger role into the future.
Well, um, Gerard asks, um, uh, I hope, Gerard, that you're actually feeling a lot more confident about uh, our prospects for fund returns through the market cycle. I hope we've demonstrated that we're doing very well in this market environment, and hopefully Nick has given a lot of context to how we position to actually take advantage of the recovery and the upside which actually sits within the businesses in which we hold. But just speaking to that, um, he asks, what are the prospects for improved performance with regards to Ford's funds Nick, that would be one for you, yeah. of course. Uh, but all I can tell you is I'm internally very confident in our performance. The specific reasons, we're trying to buy fundamental businesses that have underlying growth within those companies. We buy a bond with a fundamental reason, with a real return in mind that we're going to achieve for our investor. These are reasons that I have confidence. There'll be bumps in between. But the point is, we're thinking three and five years out of how to secure our investors' inflation-beating returns. And so we always, if the market does 20%, be the best. Probably, we, we can't always be that. But what we will be is a very solid return for you always. And, a, and because the planning and the fundamentals are behind each of our investments. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you very much, Rashad and Nick, for contributing to our questions. I just want to give a brief summary before we end off. So to summarize what we've spoken about today, Rashad spoke about the MICE framework. Uh, it's a handy way of looking at the various drivers from a macroeconomic perspective, money for the markets, interest rates, confidence and earnings. He talked about how money for the markets is actually being withdrawn. So we see liquidity has been falling since the beginning of the year. But he also mentioned that we need to watch very carefully what the Fed does, not just what they say. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on the Fed's balance sheet. He mentioned that interest rates have risen. They will continue to rise. But it's important to note that rates like the US 10-year real rate which represents the real cost of capital, already at levels that have caused considerable strain in markets historically. He acknowledged that confidence is low, for good reason, all the reasons that we know about and we speak about, but it's not at rock bottom levels. So of course, it could get worse before it gets better, and we need to be cognizant about this when we actually construct our portfolios. Earnings are at high levels, but that's largely because they've been more recently bolstered by a lot of government handouts. And the fact that governments are pulling back on spending and consumers are under pressure means that earnings will also face significant headwinds as a whole. All this means that risks still remain to the downside and we need to plan accordingly. In terms of how we invested and why, Nick spoke about the need to invest in those asset classes which are going to provide us with the best protection against inflation and the best opportunities to produce real inflation beating returns over time. He discussed though that US market valuations at the overall level are still elevated, so buying the market is not a good idea right now. Instead, we prefer to take advantage of other opportunities where we have a much higher degree of confidence in the future earning streams, but where importantly, we're buying those future earning streams at a price that makes a lot more sense. He mentioned a number of SA Inc. opportunities we're finding locally and how we're looking for investments that are, for instance, delinked to the cycle. He mentioned Aspen there and those that take advantage of structural issues such as tighter liquidity. And there PSG was what he gave as an example. He stressed the importance of choosing carefully what you're not invested in. And I think this is a big part of why Ford has been around for more than 40 years. There are times when you get more return by taking less risk. You know, we're taught in investing that you need to take more risk to get more return. But this is a very good example where you can actually get better returns by avoiding risk. He mentioned how South African bonds are now at yield levels, which are high enough to warrant some allocation, because even if yields rise significantly, the potential for capital loss is low. So that's what we want. We want situations where the potential for capital loss is low, even if we're wrong, but if we're right, there's considerable upside to come. So that's our key focus right now. The bear market is here. We're not worried about that. You can see that we've been very well prepared for that for quite some time. What we're focused on now is making sure that we're invested in the right assets for the recovery that will follow. And that's where our top-down forward-thinking approach combined with our bottom-up value approach 
has proven its worth over more than 40 years. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your time today. There is a survey that is going to pop up at the end of the session, either when you end the session or when the session ends itself. We'd really appreciate your feedback. And thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Rashad. Take care.